Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the garden question and answer video that I do on most Sundays. You can ask gardening questions down below this video and I pick from those each week. Uh, I am standing in front of the Mammoth Live Oak that's at uh, Griffin State Park in Fruitland Park, Florida. Uh, this is the second oldest uh, live oak in the state of Florida estimated. It's uh, estimated to be about 500 years old. These can live up to about 900 years. We have shot a video for it, that go on the Garden uh, garden Plants with Jim Putnam uh, video. Um, I don't know when that'll go up, but in the, in the next couple of weeks, if you're not subscribed to that channel, uh, go over there and do that. But this, this tree is amazing. There's a road back here behind me, and you may hear some road noise in this. You know, it's just amazing, you know, people driving by this thing. This thing has watched the world go by for 500 years, you know, since before the United States was the United States. And it's just such, such a beautiful tree. Steph and I will stop at any of these live oaks along our journeys that have names. And again, this one's the, uh, the mammoth oak. Okay, so let's see. Uh, this past week, there was a grafting video that went up from... Uh, from Jason Stevens and also a video we did with him with just 10 interesting plants that were at his, at, at his nursery. We shot a video on tissue culture um, at, a, at a lab here in Florida this week. I don't know if you will have seen that by the time you're watching this, but it'll probably be up the first of the week uh, or right after this video. Uh, super, super interesting. I've done a lot of propagation videos on the channel over the years so, so showing how to root cuttings or how to divide plants different ways to root plants but I've never shown grafting and that was in the video with Jason previously this week and then this week will be this next week you'll see tissue culture which is uh, there are a lot of plants that are really difficult to root uh, or there's plants that have viruses that need to be removed all kinds of interesting reasons you would do tissue culture in a lab so this is plants plant started in a lab. So I think you'll find it interesting. Again, this horticulture uh, YouTube channel, you know, covers kind of all parts from how a plant has started, how it's grown in a nursery, why something's more expensive than another plant maybe, uh, because of the technique that was used to create it, uh, the amount of time it took to grow. And then of course, you know, finished gardens uh, and you know, all parts horticulture uh, is what this channel, um, is and will continue to be. I just find I, I, I hope you find it interesting that the you know those you know how the plants that you have in your garden may have been created. So uh, another thing we filmed this week was an orchid video, first ever orchid video that will be up on the channel. I don't know again the order of things whether you have seen it uh, at this point, but it's coming. On the Learn to Garden video series, thank you guys who have signed up for that. I really appreciate it. There continues to be a $25 discount code down below the video. Uh, I don't know if there'll be a video up uh, on there this week. I've got tons of plans, you know, coming up for that. Again, that, that video series is going to be about 60 hours of all types of gardening videos. Um, hopefully, kind of a, in, a, in a logical order that teaches you gardening from, uh, from, you know, how to improve your soil to how to have a finished, how, how, how to maintain a finished garden. Okay. Uh, thank you to all everybody who for the birthday wishes last week. Last week was uh, last Sunday when the video went up was my birthday. So thank you, Gar thank you very much for that. So let's jump into some questions. Um, I always get questions. Last week's question on mulch was white worms uh, in the uh, uh, and, I, and I answered that question on the pot worms. This week it is a white fungus that's in someone's mulch. Um, all those things are fine unless your sm mulch smells funny uh, unless it's you know has a strong a strong off smell then everything is fine what's happening in your mulch whether it be a yellow slime mold on the top or one of those white fibrous uh, fungi that go through your mulch or whether it's worms or all of those things are things that are breaking that material down and making it available uh, for your plants later on so none of those th none of those things are bad unless again you have an off smell to it this person was concerned that they had used too much mulch, and you could definitely do that on established beds. You know, if you're starting a bed and you're not going to plant for a long time, it's kind of you can you can put a lot of mulch. But on your established beds, I don't typically put as much. You know, each each time I want it to kind of break down almost entirely between applications. So anyway, but all of those things are beneficial. It's life is happening in your garden. Congratulations. Okay, um, somebody said. They have a hard time finding triple shredded hardwood mulch 
in the Atlanta area. Somebody else said it about South Carolina, I think. Uh, sometimes the mulch is called something different in your area. So just ask the mulch uh, places that are in your area around the Atlanta area for hardwood mulch and then get the one that's been ground the most. It used to be called double shredded hardwood. I don't know what happened to these guys' shredders that they needed a third time to get the same exact material. I think it was they could up the price $2 a yard by calling it triple instead of double. I don't really know. Um, but uh, anyway, that's what it's typically called in my area in Raleigh is triple shredded hardwood. Again, it may just be called something different, but there's almost certainly some sort of hardwood mulch available in the Atlanta area for sure. Okay. Uh, let's see, tons more questions about freeze damage on burned leaves, and I haven't been able to get around to your photo, the, to the photos yet, but again, in summary, if you have black, brown, damaged, you know, plants, I think it's still too early to be cutting those things back, deciding what needs to be cut back. I'm going to wait till a little further in the spring toward bud break when, when we're going to get new growth. The plant will leaf out where it's going to leaf out and you can cut it back to that height at that time. I mean, that's the best thing that I can tell you. Again, I continue to see some things that were damaged in our garden before we left to come down here to Florida uh, that are still showing additional damage. And again, some of the things that I thought were damaged looking better and better, really. Um, so I, I would just let it play out uh, for a few more weeks. And as it you know, really starts to warm up in March, we'll make those decisions on what's gonna get cut back. There'll be plenty of video content during the month of February and March on, on those damaged plants, you know, recovering from that. Okay, let's see. Uh, somebody has a sloped uh, area in their garden. I talked about last week, you know, if you have sloped spaces and you have turf grass, you probably have erosion. I mean, especially if you're mowing the grass kind of low, you'll see what appears to be roots coming to the surface that a lot of times I think is the soil actually disappearing. I'll see little rocks and pebbles and things on spaces where uh, those didn't just appear from nowhere. Your, your, your lighter soil got eroded away and the pebbles were too large to wash away. So they've stayed on top. So I'll see that, you know, when I, when I see that, I know that erosion is taking place. They're going to be converting this uh, sloped space with grass on it that has erosion. Uh, into bed space. Bed space is definitely going to be less erodible. So if you have shrubs, trees, ground covers, all those kinds of things are going to help uh, slow that erosion uh, for sure. And so this was a park shade space. So any kind of grasses like Carex are going to be helpful for that. Um, you know, any of our native woodland shrubs like Itea or uh, American Beauty Berry, any, anything you put on there other than turf where you're mowing it is, is, is going to help with erosion plus mulching it um, as well. Uh, so somebody has fungal leaf spot on their Indian hawthorns and then they have a couple things there with it. So they have uh, some sort of rose uh, that also has it and an azalea that looks like it has it as well. Uh, that Intimosporium, Intimosporium, I think is the name of that fungus. That's the same fungus that got the red tip fetinias. Okay, so it's, it's a rose family based fungal disease. And it starts off with little red spots. It's the same exact thing you're seeing on the Indian hawthorn as what we saw, again, saw on the red tip fetinia that it killed them. It's run amok in older Indian hawthorn varieties and it's killing them too. So they wanted to know if it was the same fungal issues. Well, Likely, it's the same fungal issue on the rose, right? Because this is a rose family issue. Indian hawthorns, fetinia, uh, rose family is gigantic. And so this disease is shared through that. The fungal issue you see on your azaleas is probably something different, but something similar. Uh, I would start to question, you know, if I had this, not so much on the Indian hawthorn, because the Indian hawthorn is just absolutely, you know, they've become extremely susceptible to it. But if I have it, on several different things and it's several different leaf spot type issues. I'm wondering if the space is draining well, if it's too, if it's too wet in this area, if there's good air movement, if the leaves dry out uh, on the plants quick enough in this area, is it, are they in more shade than they would like? Because certainly all three of those things would prefer to be in almost full sun. That may be keeping the leaves, uh, wetter. Well, azaleas would need to be, would like to be in the park shade, but they do like good air movement. So 
Um, I might question the space a little bit, but definitely they wanted to know if they should get rid of the Indian Hawthorns. Definitely the Hawthorns need to go because uh, they will not get better. Your rows may improve because um, you can cut it down to the ground, dispose of everything in the late winter and see if it will grow back cleaner with a little more air and space around it. Uh, you know, um, but, but it is interesting. That disease is the same on the rose and the Indian Hawthorn likely uh, and all throughout the rose family. Let's see, um, somebody asked about a good marker uh, and labeling tags. I think the plastic, that, plastic tag or wooden tag or whatever you're using is less relevant. You can almost use anything. I've used taking uh, plastic bottles, like a two liter bottle, and you can cut it into little narrow tags. I've done that before when I was a poor uh, person. You know, <laughs> when I was starting the nursery and I was trying to spend money to produce plants without spending money to buy tags, um, you know, I've cut up pop bottles and soda, but you know, anything, uh, but definitely want to use a nursery marker or a garden marker, um, that, you know, will hold up some, uh, there are other types of markers as well, but you know, I would Google this. The marker is almost more important than the material, uh, that you're putting it on, uh, because the sun, the sun, the sun and the water can wash any other, lots of other kind of inks away pretty quickly. And there's other types of, uh, uh markers and pencils as well that work. Uh, but I've always just used the uh, black felt nursery markers. They last for a long time as long as you put, remember to put the cap back on, which none of my employees were able to do, but um, as long as you put the tops back on, they last for a long time. Okay, um, if you, uh, let's see. Okay, somebody asked if you're pruning, so you have a, you have a shrub in a container. If you're pruning it um, and, and pulling it out of the container and pruning the roots occasionally, can you leave it in the container forever? Yeah, absolutely. You do need to change some of the soil out periodically, but that's the same thing as bonsai, right? I mean, bonsai plant, you know, when they're, people are bonsaiing, they're, they can keep, you know, keep the same bonsai plant in the same container forever. They do typically up the container size a bit to match the, to more match, you know, the top growth on the plant. But yeah, you can keep them in a container forever. Again, a little bit of root pruning, a little bit of top pruning, and a little bit of new soil occasionally. And they don't have access to mineral content that's in the ground, so for a little bit of fertilizer uh, as well. Uh, so somebody, uh, somebody was in Greenville, South Carolina, just asked if I've grown mully grass and uh, you know recommend planting it. Yeah, oh yeah, then it's, Mullenbergia is native to the southeast same as this southern live oak um, behind me, uh, native to the southeast. So you're in Greenville, South Carolina, you're in the perfect place to be growing mully grass. Typically when I see mully grass and get excited about mully grass, it's in a mass. So five, seven, nine, 11 plants. I don't know what kind of space you have. And I love the white one as well. Don't overlook that. You know, the pink mully grass and the white mully grass, both beautiful. Uh, but you're in the perfect place to grow them, just in a place that drains fairly well. Um, not sitting in water. Uh, let's see, uh, they don't mind sitting near water. They'll, they'll sit near a stream or something and reach their roots down in it. You'll see them frequently used in drainage swells and that kind of thing in native restoration areas, but not sitting down in the water typically. Okay, let's see. Um, so somebody had the tree fall on a camellia and a laurel and a larger uh, deciduous magnolia. Uh, wanted to know how far they could cut the laurel and the camellia back. Both are very tolerant to pretty heavy pruning. So I don't normally recommend people prune their camellias back hard, but ones that do get pruned back hard do come back out of it. But I would expect it to take several years to reestablish itself into something that looks pretty good. The laurel probably much quicker. Their magnolia is on a lean and wanted to know how to straighten it out, but it's four or five inches in diameter. I think the only way would be to anchor it to another tree and use some sort of, uh, or anchor it to something you could put in the ground uh, and slowly bring it up uh, by put, you know, adjusting it slowly, almost like braces on your teeth where you know, it's just done slowly a little bit over time. But you could use some sort of ratchet strap and pull that tree back up uh, and not try to do it all at once. Uh, and be careful that you're not damaging you know, the cambium on the outside of it. But a four to five inch diameter magnolia is gonna take some effort, real effort uh, to get it uh, standing back up again. But I think some sort of ratchet strap where you could just, you know, up it just a little bit at a time over the course of some period of time. I don't know what kind of time frame that is.
because I don't know how well the thing is anchored and how willing it will be. It might be just completely willing to come right back up in one shot. And then you just leave it staked for some period of time. Um, let's see. Uh, so somebody has their pansies were badly damaged, wanted to know if they should prune off the brown material. They are starting to show some new growth. I don't think you need to prune the brown material off of them. I, I think the new growth will just cover it up. If you got time on your hands and you want to, yes. Um, I probably am not that patient. Uh, to go out. I will say though, the reason, one of the main reasons I wrote this down is I just did fertilize my pansies. It's got warmer, you know, after that bad, bad cold spell. So I, before, I, before we left town, I fertilized um, all of our pansies. And I used an organic fertilizer, which doesn't work the best when it's cold outside in the winter, but I think it will also help maybe with the, keeping the rabbits out as well. That's that off smell from the organic fertilizer. Uh, that's my hope, that's my hope anyway. Um, so, uh, so, okay, so somebody asked how close they can let the grass get to their uh, oak tree. Uh, well, <laughs> this one they've kept cleared all the way around this big giant oak so people can come up here and take a look at it and admire it. I'm surprised somebody hasn't walked up this path yet while I'm filming this. Uh, so far, so good. Uh, but you can, oaks are definitely, I mean, no tree wants grass growing right up to the bottom of it. But when I look around urban in suburban gardens, oaks tend to be the most tolerant of, of that kind of thing where grass has grown right up to them. And you know, in our neighborhood, no, oaks that are 90 years old have had grass growing literally right up to the base of them that entire time. And, the, and they're fine. Other trees, I think, less likely to, uh, to appreciate that. So you can, you can literally grow the grass probably right up to them. I don't think that that's ideal. I would want, in the way I grew my willow oaks at the old house is I expanded that bed to the drip line year over year over year. So the bed they were in got bigger as they needed that space. I did have some underplanted shrubs underneath them, but no grass. But as a rule, I think, you know, or as my, from my observation, oaks are one of the most tolerant trees of having the grass up to the base of them. Uh, so somebody has a shady area and they want a grass look underneath it, but the grass is not, um, but the, you know, regular turf grass will not grow in it. It's just too, it's too shady. If you want that kind of grass look, there are Carexes like Carex Pennsylvanica, or um, if you wanted something slightly larger than that, you can use one of the other, you know, larger growing Carexes uh, that would give you somewhat of a grass look, but not necessarily. You can use dwarf mondo grass. People frequently use that as a turf grass look uh, in a shady area. It's not going to be traffic tolerant. You're not going to go throw frisbee on your you know, dwarf mondo grass, but it is going to look like uh, turf grass uh, in that space. And you can, you know, like any other type of turf grass, you can define an area you want it to grow in and then, and then plug it in. And then you can divide it later into other areas if you wanted to. But there are ways to get that kind of turf grass look in deep shady areas without using, you know, a turf grass. So as an ongoing joke on the channel, I have to say the word Laura Petalum every week. Somebody asked what the purple shrub was behind me uh, last week as, because I've said it in so many of these Q and A's for whatever, it always comes up as a question or it's always behind me in part, in when I'm shooting at the house. And so I always, end, again, I always end up saying Laura Petalum or having to answer the question, what is that purple plant? So that's, that's what it is. And that leads me to the next question, which somebody had um, a landscape plan done and it's on the north side of their house in zone 7B. And it includes crimson fire uh, Laura Petalum, which is a dwarf Laura Petalum, similar to that, uh, uh, <sighs> I'm going to lose the name of it real quick. Uh, the uh, uh, <laughs> sunshine day that sunshine daydream. No, it's not sunshine daydream. It's purple purple daydream Laura Petalum. I got it. I'm looking at Steph back here, and a good words wouldn't come to my head. Purple daydream Laura Petalum and crimson fire, very similar in size. And then it also included some fire chief arborvita, and they didn't think it was sunny enough in that location. I, I've talked about this before in the south. Uh, in the summertime, the sun actually tracks north of us. And so for about eight weeks in the summertime, six to eight weeks, it's really hot and really, really sunny if we don't have any protection on that side of the house. Then the sun, of course, retreats back tracking in the south where it is this morning, you know, coming up in the southeast and setting in the southwest. And that's shady for like 10 months out of the year. And it can be a very tricky space. But it can be hot, super hot and dry, like the hottest time of the year is when it's hot and dry and sunny, 
Uh, and then in the winter time, it can be the wettest spot uh, in our garden. So it is a very tricky space. So I would also question that, uh, the, the, the use of those two plants. I would go back to the landscape designer and ask them for maybe native plants in that space. I, I've talked, again, talked about this before. I think that when you have difficult spaces in your landscape, changeable spaces where it's gonna be sunny sometimes and shady sometimes and dry sometimes and wet sometimes, uh, that's the, that's the times I definitely lean on native plants. And so that might be the thing I go back to them and ask them for a native plant replacement uh, for that space. And I think you would, um, uh, those things would be more likely to take the changeability of the year, uh, just being tough, right? Uh, let's see, I talked about, so last week I talked, uh, I had had a question about gardening on a budget. And I talked about you know, starting your own seeds, dividing plants and sharing them, maybe going on a Facebook group that shares seed and shares divisions of perennials and plants. And, you know, maybe somebody that, that sticks cuttings can share some of the, uh, you know, their, their propagated plants with you. Uh, maybe starting a Facebook group for that kind of thing. And somebody mentioned uh, also buying small containers. And I, big fan of small containers. We go down to a nursery called Big Bloomers in Sanford, North Carolina in the spring, buy a lot of our annuals that we purchase um, from them. Uh, most of our annuals are from seed. A lot of our perennials, they grow a lot of things in very small containers. Uh, and uh, it's just a great place. I love doing small containers. And not just because of a budget. Uh, I, I made a living off growing small containers for years at my nursery. I started plants for other nurseries in uh, three quart containers, we trade gallon containers, we call them, where it's a fake gallon is what it is. Uh, and a lot, I had a big customer group uh, for those containers because, you know, maybe somebody has a shady area with a lot of roots and it's hard to dig holes. Uh, it's hard to dig big holes in those spaces. Uh, maybe again, just being on a budget. And I also like to watch things grow, right? It's kind of nice to have a garden in which you're watching things grow. And so again, I like to plant small things. So that was a great suggestion for finding small containers. Unfortunately, a lot of new plant introductions, the, the breeders and folks and the companies aren't allowing, you know, things to go in small containers, which is disappointing in my mind, or they're making them go into a branded container, you know, a very small branded container. I'd love to get some of the expense out of that and keeping in mind that there are people who can't afford a $4 annual in a little pot. So, uh, you know, throwing that out there. Uh, let's see. So uh, last question for this week. Again, thank you guys for your participation. This garden question and answer video does not exist without your participation and your great questions. Great questions every week. Um, so keep them coming. Let's see. Uh, somebody asked about planting, uh, the timing of planting hollies in Virginia. So they're in zone 7A up in Virginia, wanted to know when to plant hollies. The reason I, I wrote this question down was because uh, this is the time of year I start thinking about, uh, uh, about new having new growth on plants and where the plants are coming from and the timing of putting them in the ground. So if I went to a garden center or nursery right now and there was a plant on a table that had been there for the last you know, through the fall and through the winter, and it had been outside and it was acclimated to my temperatures in my area, I'm buying that and putting it in the ground. I plant 12 months out of the ground as long as the ground's workable. Uh, not on the maybe the wettest days of the year, but any other day I'm planting, as long as the plant is, again, kind of acclimated to my space. What you'll see this time of year as the garden centers and folks are starting to bring plants in, almost all of them are buying from zones south of them. Okay, so just from... The, the way the economy of, you know, the, the, way, the way this works is plants grown on the Gulf Coast are less expensive to produce than plants in the Northeast just because of the overwintering, the amount of labor and time, plastic and all those kinds of things that goes into overwintering a plant in a colder area versus a warmer area. Plus, the time, you know, they may only have six months of growing time up in the Northeast where they may have nine months uh, on the Gulf Coast. So almost every garden center, if you're, if you're buying from a garden center in Virginia, plants might be coming from North Carolina, South Carolina. You're buying plants in South Carolina, they're probably coming from the Gulf Coast. That's the way it works. Well, as they're getting plants in this time of year, they may have already started growing, you know, and not right now in January, but certainly by February and March. My frost-free date, or my average last frost date, we should call it, 
is around April 15th uh, in my area in Raleigh. I don't want to go buy a shrub on March 15th that's completely covered in flowers or completely covered in new growth because it's going to be vulnerable to a frost. So that's the only thing I'm looking for when I'm planting. I plant 12 months out of the year, just don't want it actively growing at a time where it could be damaged by frost or freeze. And so that's all I'm really looking for. I wouldn't want to buy a perennial, you know, like a cone flower or something like that that was already up, you know, a foot tall in March and put it in the ground with four weeks of potential frost left, that kind of thing. So again, thanks for your participation. And uh, uh, again, this, I think pretty good upcoming content uh, in the next couple of weeks. Once we get started on February, it's just gonna be a, a crazy amount of pruning videos, mulching, bed prep, bed, bed expansion, seeding, lots and lots of uh, videos coming up uh, in February on those things. So thanks for following along.